there, Paul. Hiya. Hey, what are we going to do today? Oh, today the whole show's got a sporting flavour. Oh, like prawn cocktail. Yeah, like... I love prawn no, cocktail. not prawn cocktail. Oh. No, it's all about sport. You know, like grandstand, only better. Grandstand? Yeah. Now, the first thing we need is the running orders. Running orders? Yes. Ready, steady, go. And here we go. I'm going to up and the down the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where are you going? You gave me the running orders, didn't you? Not that kind of running orders. Oh. No, it's what's called in the trade a menu. Oh, we're back to prawn cocktail again, aren't we? I said we would. No, that, no, we? no. It's a piece of paper that lists out a schedule bit by bit of what you're going to do throughout the show. Oh. Don't you know nothing? No, I don't know nothing. Didn't think you did. Oh. No, no, what we need really is a presenter. A presenter? Mm. Hey, Paul, can I do it? Oh, no, no. It's got to be somebody who knows all about sport. Well, that's me then, isn't it? Hey. Well, I won the five metres underwater hurdles at school, didn't I? Did you? Yeah, I was. Oh, wait, away. I'll tell you what, I'll give you a test. Well, you yeah. sit down in the chair and I'll ask you a couple of questions. Can I sit in the chair? You sit in the chair, yes. Now, first of all, it's a question on soccer. Soccer? Yeah. I'm good at soccer. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, it's a three-part question. You can have the first part first, the second part first, or the third part first. I'll have the third part first. Right. Who scored the goal? I'm not going to be very good at this. No, I didn't think no, you would be, really. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We've already got somebody. Have you? Yes, someone with great intellect who knows everything about sport, from fencing to furlongs, everything. Oh, great. Who have we got? Me. morning. Uh, we've got a packed programme for you today here on Chuckle Vision Sports View. Uh, Nigel Mansell will be here. Later, in his racing car, we'll have live coverage of an international football match between... Uh, sorry. sorry. Yes? Uh, Nigel Mansell will be here later in his racing car. <laughs> uh, we've got an international football match between the greatest footballers ever team and Rotherham United reserves. Uh, there's also snooker coverage from the Crucible and, of course, oh, no, steeplechasing oh, 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 from Aintree. Uh, I'm getting a message in my ear. Uh, the snooker final has entered a crucial stage, so it's straight over to muttering Mike Mason at the Crucible. And you've just made it back in time to see the world champion Steve Davis as he lines up on what could be the match-winning shot. <laughs> By Jove, he is in trouble. His braces have snapped. So, with Steve Davis looking like he's in trouble here, with a match-winning opportunity and no braces, it's back to the studio. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, fine. Uh, we'll be keeping in touch with developments as and when they happen. Isn't it going well? It is, isn't it? Uh, I've just been handed this piece of paper. With nothing on it. Sorry. <laughs> Wrong one. Uh, yes, uh, Oh, here's an interesting piece of news. Uh, it seems that tomorrow sees the launch of a brand new newspaper all about athletics. It's called The Daily Thompson. <laughs> um, and now uh, it's over to our exclusive interview with Nigel Mansell. He isn't here yet. Hey? He's not here yet. He's supposed to be coming with his racing car, Williams Honda. That's a problem. William wouldn't lend him the Honda. Oh, dear. Oh, uh, uh, well, well, back to the Crucible and muttering Mike Mason. Well, let's have a look at this from another angle. Hmm. Well, back to the studio. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just answer the phone. <coughs> yes? Oh, oh word from Crystal Palace. It seems that another record's been broken. Barry, you didn't touch that, did you? No, I didn't touch it. Oh, oh it's all right, it was Steve Cram. It seems that Steve Cram has broken his fifth record this year. That's very clumsy of him, isn't it? It is, isn't it? And he's breaking five records. Yeah. Well, don't forget, uh, the big match will come up later from Anfield. I tell you what, let's pop over to Anfield now and see how the big match tension is building up. Well, you join us here at Anfield waiting for the big match. Must admit, I expect to see a few more people. But there's still time yet, I suppose. Well, here we are behind the scenes at Anfield, where right now the famous are getting ready. They're all here in this dressing room, 
and we at Chucklevision Sports View have arranged an exclusive interview with Maradona. <laughs> Get out of it! Well, it seems he's not quite ready for us at the moment, so back to the studio. And now it's over to racing at Aintree. Well, as you can see, it's a bit misty here, and the start of the race has been delayed, so I'll hand you back to the studio. Oh, uh, let's see what's going on at the Crucible. Well, there's not a lot happening here. That was quick. Uh, well, as you can see, uh, there's not a lot of sport going on at the moment, so uh, in the meantime, let's have a look at one of the Chucklevision award-winning drama spectaculars, Armchair Theatre. Barry, can you get us another cup of tea? The park is the name the council have given to what used to be wasteland and trees. The council has laid out one part as a playground with swings, a giant sandpit and a slide. Beyond this part, the ground begins to rise. Buildings and trees are left behind and you reach what everybody, well, everybody except the council, calls Old Baldy. Old Baldy is just a hill. It's bald of trees but grassy and it's the highest point for miles around. It's very open and it's very windy. And that's where the Elm Street lot go kite flying. Up the hill they go, Sim Tolland in the lead, because somehow he always takes the lead. And, of course, he carries the kite. Close behind, with an anxious eye on the kite, comes Ginger Jones, because he made it easy. And then Kitty and Johnny Bates and the rest of the Elm Street lot and Vera Clegg. Now, Vera Clegg always comes last and miles behind because she has a little brother, Jimmy, and he's in his push chair, or his horse box, as he calls it. By the time Vera reaches the top of Old Baldy, the Elm Street mob have probably got the kite up. There she goes, St. Tolland says softly over and over again as he lets the kite string out. And there she goes, up and up, higher and higher, smaller and smaller into the distances of the sky. Once the kite is right up, anybody can have a go at holding the string. And provided you remember to bring some paper, you can send up messengers. A messenger is just a bit of paper, any old bit, that's slotted onto the kite string at the bottom, and then, steadily, as if by magic, it will rise up the kite string, up, 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 until it can go no further, until it reaches the kite itself. One day, Sim had trouble in bringing the kite down again. Look out for those treetops, said Ginger Jones. She's beginning to swoop a bit. Oh, said Vera Clegg. Ah, she's all right, said Sim. It's the best kite I've made so far, you know, said Ginger. OK, then, you bring it down, said Sim. But at that moment, the kite flung itself headlong into the top of one of the trees on the lower slopes of Old Baldy and settled there. Now look what you've done, said Ginger. Ah, keep your bright hair on, said Sim. It's only a question of getting her down. Only, said Ginger. And they marched off down the hill with Sim pulling in the string behind him. They all gathered round the tree. They could see the kite, but they couldn't exactly get to it. <coughs> Johnny Bates climbed on Sim Tollan's shoulder to reach a lower branch, and that's when they heard the park keeper. Oi, oi, he said. What are you doing up there? Our kite, said Sim. My kite, said Ginger. We'll have to stay there, won't it? Are said Sim. Are yourself, said the keeper. This particular keeper spent most of his spare time kite flying on Old Baldy, so he was on the side of kite flying and kite flyers. But his duty as a park keeper came first. No climbing of high trees, not for any reason at all. So the kite stayed at the top of the high tree. Sim Tolland apologised to Ginger Jones, but Ginger refused to make another kite. And then came Vera Clegg's birthday. That morning, Kitty Bates rushed up to the others, hair flying, breathless. She, You've never seen such a thing, she cried. Vera's merchant navy uncle has sent it to her. It's made of painted silk, black and gold and red, and there are wings and a little tinkly bell. What are you talking about, said Johnny. I'm just telling you, it's Vera's kite. Sim Tolland drew his breath in sharply. Come on, he said, and led the Elm Street lot down to Clegg's house. They crowded into the kitchen, where Vera was sitting at a breakfast table covered with presents and birthday cards. And leaning against the wall was the kite. A huge and splendid kite, shaped like a bird, with red wings whose pinions were tipped with gold and black. 
and the little gilded bell of which Kitty Bates had spoken hung round what you might call its throat. We'll help you fly your new kite if you like, Vera, said Sim, the first to break the silence of wonder and admiration. No, thank you, said Vera faintly, and then she added, there's no string. Have plenty, said Ginger. No, thank you, said Vera, even more faintly. But her mother said, you go with them, Vera. I'll just pop Jimmy into his push chair and he can go too. He'll be no trouble. And that was what Mrs Clegg really thought. And Vera was such a good girl that she never contradicted. Up they went to the top of Old Baldy, Sim carrying the kite and Ginger just behind with his reel of nylon kite string, then Kitty and Johnny, and last of all, Vera Clegg, panting behind the push chair. She was the only one not excited, she was the only one not happy. I'll tie the string on, Ginger, said Sim Tollen when they reached the top. Remember to notch it twice, Sim, said Ginger. Ah, teach your grandmother, said Sim. Then calling down to Slope to Vera, he shouted, We'll get it in the air for you, Vera! went up like the beard it was, with a little flurry of tinkling from its bell. The park keeper heard the bell from the lower slopes of Old Baldy and looked up. He saw the triumph of the bird kite soaring up and away. Here, Vera, you take it. It's your kite, said Sim. Vera took the reel and held it tight and stared into the sky. Chomo smiled. Kitty and Johnny Bates tore up some of their paper and began sending messengers. Three had gone right up when it happened. The kite string suddenly went slack in Vera's hand. At the same time, the kite itself, as far as they could see it at that distance, began to move wildly in all directions but upwards. It seemed to have gone mad. The string's broken, Kitty Bay cried. Couldn't, said Ginger. Something's come loose, the knots or not. He looked at Sim Tolland, who had tied the knots or not. They watched the kite fall in mad plunges until it disappeared from sight among the faraway houses on the other side of the park. It was lost. The worst was that Vera Clegg never said anything, even to Sim Tolland, whose fault it had almost certainly been. She began to cry. She dropped the kite string and started for home with the push chair. They all went home. Sim Tolland came last, all by himself. About two weeks after the loss of the bird kite, a visitor came looking for the Elm Street lot. It was the park keeper. Lost anything? He said. Well, She's lost a kite, said Sim. Well, at least I lost it for her. What was it like, said the park keeper. It was like a bird, a big, beautiful bird, said Vera. It was my birthday present. Ah, said the keeper. Well, it came down in a garden on the other side of the park. It had this messenger attached to it. It's a bit of an old envelope with a name, Clegg, attached to it, and the remains of an address, Elm Street. Here you are, Clegg of Elm Street. And he handled a parceled up kite to Vera. Indoors, she went straight up to her bedroom and unpacked the kite. She gazed at it lovingly. She stood on a chair and hung her on a nail well out of Jimmy's reach. And there it has stayed ever since. Meanwhile, the Elm Street lot fly the other kite, the kite to end all kites, that Ginger made with Sim Tolland helping. The park keeper says, it's not bad. And Sim Tolland takes his turn with the others now, not always first like before. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, and you're just in time as we hand you back to the exciting match at the Crucible. Well, there's still not a lot going on here. Don't forget, though, you'll not miss any of the action. Back to the studio. Now, as Mike was saying there, don't forget that here on Chuckle Vision, we'll keep you posted of all events as and when they happen, and I promise you, you won't miss any of the action. Now, what's next? Where are you? Racing. Over at the tenth, the McChuckle brothers are just about ready to take off. <laughs> <laughs> I have got you that you can do it. Hey, I can do it. Hi! Ah, there you are, dear Z. Hey, 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 see.
You join us here at Ainfree just as the big race is due to begin. Oh my goodness, they're off! Yes, it's the start of this year's Chuckle Brothers Celebrity Handicap Steeplechase. And coming up to the first fence is Manny Lowe by a nose, followed closely on the outside by Sue Smith. He's obviously carrying overweight. Now, over to uh, someone else. Well, here at Anfield, we're only a few moments to the start of the big match. And this is the very turf they'll be running about on. Word is from the ticket sales that it'll be an all-time record gate. It's about time I was making my way to the commentary box. The umpire will be along any minute now. Back to the racing. And they're all over the first with five fences to go. And they're passing the railway line now. Goodness, that was close. And the 520 from Lime Street is coming through on the rails with a bicycle on the stand. And they're out in the country now. And now it's time for the water jump. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, uh, don't forget, uh, we'll not let you miss any of the action here today. Oh, excuse me. Oh. oh, it seems that Steve Davis has missed, and we missed it. And there's missed at Aintree. Right, now it's over to the big event of the day. Over to Anfield to see the big match between the greatest footballers ever team and Rotherham United Reserves. Great stuff. And there's the referee's whistle, and they've had the kick-off. And it's Pelly to Keegan. Keegan to Robson, and Robson gets it up hey, there. Just a minute, just a minute. This one's got a cricket bat, and he's twice as big as everybody else. Well, cos it's Ian Botham, isn't it? Ian Botham? Yeah, but he plays football as well. Yeah, but he's got a cricket bat. I know, but I was a player short. <sighs> anyway, it's your goal. My goal? Yes. Oh, that's all right, then. And he Come comes on. in from the back, and he puts it across the middle, right. and he goes... And that must be a penalty. That's got to be a penalty. That's a penalty to the greatest football team ever. And John Breckin's going to take this And it's back to the studio. And it's back to the studio. Back to the studio? Oh, 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 well, that's it then. Uh, don't forget that next week... Yes, we'll it's a goal! Get in the net! Um, yeah, as I was saying, next week we'll have... Uh, oh, latest bit of news. Um, it seems... Oh, the greatest footballers team ever, nil. Rotherham United Reserves, one. Um, what are you talking about one nil? It wasn't that when I left it. Hey, 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 just a minute, that's cheating, that. It's that's not my cheating. shot. It is my shot. You should hey. have been playing on. Oh, come on. Look, he's coming through. No. And, and you missed it. Yes, it's, it's a goal. Oh, 